Robert Pape. I'm a professor at the University of Chicago, and I'm the director of the Chicago Project on Security and Terrorism. I am uh, Jenna Jordan, and I am a postdoctoral scholar at the um, Harris School for Public Policy, and I'm a fellow at the Chicago Project on Security and Terrorism as well. As you already know, the death of Osama bin Laden is by far the most prominent success that we've had in the war on terror in the last 10 years. There's no more successful day that we've had than today celebrating the success. But there are large questions about what is the long term? What, how much should we really be confident about our future? And the answer is that it turns a lot on how we follow up today's major success. Because as you'll hear, especially from Jenna, leadership decapitation of terrorist groups, even religious terrorist groups, in and of itself, rarely cripples a terrorist organization. What really matters is what happens after that leader is killed. What really matters are the next steps that follow up after that leader is killed. Today, many people are asking, is there a possibility of retaliation after uh, the death of Osama bin Laden? And the answer is yes, in the short term. In the short term, it is fully possible that remnants of al-Qaeda will seek to avenge his death. Osama bin Laden was very much the hub in the middle of a, a wheel, and there are spokes that still exist, and many of those spokes may seek to operate independently. However, that, and that does mean that we do need to worry about the safety of Americans all over the world, just as President Obama and our State Department is doing. However, this also poses opportunities for us because those individual spokes, if they want to be effective, that is not just do uh, an attack that burns out in a blaze of glory, but actually have an effective attack, they're going to have to put this together on the fly. They will have to talk to each other. They will have to plan. They will have to do reconnaissance. All of those are major opportunities for our intelligence services to collect information and actually to roll up the group. That's why intelligence services that have been on the job, on the ball, not only in getting information to kill the leader in the first place, but to follow that up in an aggressive way, have actually had success in rolling up groups. Secondly, and probably far more important, is whether we take steps starting in the next few months to significantly undermine the long-term support that Al-Qaeda has enjoyed in various parts of the Muslim world. The crucial pillar of Osama bin Laden's support from the beginning in the 1990s has been the deployment of large-scale American military forces, first on the Arabian Peninsula and then in Afghanistan. This is something that we've actually been a bit reluctant to talk about because we'd like to believe that when we station a large army overseas, it will necessarily make us safer. The fact is, it's been at most a mixed blessing. What made Osama bin Laden popular, what made him famous, was not being an Islamic radical. There were dozens and hundreds of Islamic radicals. What made him famous was his public and public uh, vigorous opposition to the deployment of tens of thousands of American ground forces in Saudi Arabia and other countries on the Arabian Peninsula in the 1990s. That became the rallying cry that brought dozens and then hundreds to support Al-Qaeda. And that's why the most important next step we can take to undermine the group is, in fact, over the next six months or a year, to begin large-scale withdrawals of ground forces from Afghanistan and to continue the already significant withdrawals that are underway in Iraq. Because if we take today's major success and follow it up with undermining the long-term support for Al-Qaeda, what we will do is render that group increasingly fragile, increasingly uh, a group that's falling apart, not a group that is reconstituting itself. I have looked at about 300 cases of decapitation, which can refer to either the killing or arresting of a leader, and basically looked at whether it was effective when it worked and when it didn't work. Decapitation rarely brings about the demise of a terrorist group. So if we take this analysis and we apply it to the case of Al-Qaeda, 
it would indicate that it's not likely to be effective in the case of Al-Qaeda. At least decapitation alone is not likely to be effective. So Al-Qaeda started in 1988. We have an organization over 20 years of age. Um, if we look at Al-Qaeda's membership, and even looking beyond just Al-Qaeda core, if we're including its affiliates in, um, you know, in the Islamic Maghreb, in the Arabian Peninsula, there's clearly over 500 members also should increasing its stability. And we have a religious organization, I think that's very clear. So these things would indicate that decapitation is really not, uh, decapitation alone is really not likely to be effective against Al Qaeda. And in fact, what my data shows is that against these sort of types of organizations, older groups, larger groups, religious groups, um, targeting their leader actually can increase their resilience and increase their lifespan overall. And I think a lot of this has to do with what Professor Pape was talking about in terms of things like support, things like retaliatory attacks. So these are the sort of, you know, if we look at other cases of decapitation, very prominent cases that have happened in the past, look, taking uh, Hamas, for instance. You know, in 2004, we saw the targeting of very high profile leaders, Yassine and Rantisi. And in the aftermath of these attacks, we saw retaliatory attacks. We saw a huge increase in the amount of support for Hamas, and in fact, you know, resulting in got, uh, Hamas winning the legislative elections in 2006. You talked about retaliation in the short term. Yep. Should Chicago, should America worry about their safety? Uh, they're going to worry whether we tell them to or not, and it's a good thing. You see, public awareness, being publicly alert, often comes from being worried about your safety. And today, I am sure that if there's any question of any suspicious activity whatsoever, people are calling the FBI, they're calling the police, they're calling any first responder they can think of. That is a good situation to be in, because that means that it's going to be highly unlikely that we're just going to be surprised. Who's surprised today? Al Qaeda. That's who's surprised. That's the way we want to keep it. Do cities like Chicago present a clear terrorist retaliation threat? Uh, any, yes, Chicago does present a greater retaliatory threat than the average city in the United States. Why is that? It's because we have very famous buildings in Chicago. Uh, we have, of course, the Sears Tower. The Sears Tower um, was, uh, has been mentioned among um, bin Laden's favorite targets, so to speak. It's being famous makes it prominent on any list. But by the way, that's something we know very well at this point, and the bad guys know very well at this point. The real energy for Al Qaeda is coming from the long-term presence of the large-scale forces the United States has stationed in Muslim countries. You said that the Al Qaeda leadership is probably going to have to plan something on the what Al Qaeda is trying to do is trying to kill large numbers of people. That's why if you look at the Al Qaeda attacks, there's simply a pattern in their attacks. They attack transportation systems. They often try to attack airplanes. They often, the Times Square bomber, he's trying to attack uh, a group of people in a prominent place, such as Times Square. Um, that's, uh, what, is, what do they all have in common? Large numbers of people in a well-defined space. And that's really what's driving Al-Qaeda's targeting choice. It's not really being driven by a religious calendar or religious symbolism. Um, and so it is simply the case that um, over the next few months, we are going to have to be um, alert. But again, I want to tell you that we are going to be alert naturally. And it's a good thing that we're going to be alert naturally because we can all take comfort that our neighbors are helping us. There, is, there are two parts of the terrorist organization, so to speak. There's the existing members of the terrorist organizations, those that have already wanted to become terrorists and who are trying to carry out attacks. Um, with a suicide terrorist organization, you can't just rely on those existing members because when you do a suicide attack, you only get to do one of those, right? So suicide terrorist organizations always depend on the next generation. The next generation of suicide terrorists are overwhelmingly walk-in volunteers. They're not longtime members of an organization, and those walk-in volunteers are motivated over 95% of the time 
by anger at the presence of ground forces on territory the terrorists prize. That's why the more we've put forces in Afghanistan, the more we've stimulated terrorism in Afghanistan. The more we've withdrawn forces from Iraq, the more we've decreased terrorism in Iraq. And so what we need to do is worry about the next generation. Because if the next generation doesn't come, then increasingly the current generation just becomes more fragile, more fragile, and more fragile, and collapses. However, if we make a different choice, if we decide, oh, for the next few years, let's stay tough, let's keep that big army in Afghanistan, then I'm afraid the prospects start to turn on the other side. What we think is that big force is going to make us safe? No, it's going to mobilize more terrorists than it's going to kill. Did it surprise anyone where he was found in Pakistan, in a military city, and what does that say about the state of our relationship with Pakistan? If you talk to anybody who does covert operations, they'll often tell you the best place to hide is where they ain't looking. So <laughs> if we have this big army that's supposed to be looking all over here and there, they're just not hiding there. Um, and what we see with bin Laden is the standard intelligence operation, which is let's just hide where nobody's looking. The big thing to understand is that getting bin Laden was always going to be about intelligence. And once we had the intelligence, then tiny numbers of forces were going to be needed to get him. Once you have accurate intelligence, you only need a little bit of force to take out the leader. Without that accurate intelligence, you can have a whole army, and it's beside the point. And that's the big thing that we're learning here, which is that the deal with terrorism, this is an intelligence problem. A CIA problem, a special forces problem, it just simply doesn't help to take 100,000 ground troops and start conquering Muslim countries.